As a dean of Boston University School of Law, it is an honor for me to introduce our commencement speaker. It is particularly meaningful to introduce this year's speaker because he is a distinguished graduate of BU, Claw, BU Law from the class of 1983, Robert Kuzami. Robert Kuzami's 35-year career has spanned multiple senior-level positions in the public and private sector. He has twice served in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, the nation's largest and perhaps most well-regarded federal prosecutor's office. Until last month, Kuzami served as the Southern District's Deputy U.S. Attorney, second in command over more than 230 civil and criminal assistant U.S. attorneys. In addition, he was the acting U.S. attorney responsible for supervising United States versus Cohen, in which Michael Cohen, the ex-counsel to President Donald Trump, was convicted of campaign finance violations. From 1990 to 2002, Kuzami was an assistant U.S. attorney also for the Southern District of New York, where he was part of a prosecution team in what was then the largest terrorism trial in U.S. history. The trial resulted in the conviction of Omar Ahmed Ali Abdel Rahman and nine co-defendants for operating an international terrorist organization responsible for, among other crimes, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. For their efforts, the prosecution team was awarded the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, the highest award offered by the Justice Department. Kuzami also led the Division of the Enforcement at the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, otherwise known as the SEC, from 2009 to 2013. He was appointed director of the office shortly after the 2008 financial crisis and immediately following revelations of Bernard Madoff's massive Ponzi scheme. He guided the division through the most significant restructuring in its history while it filed cases in record numbers, many of which involved high, highly complex and emerging financial markets, products, and transactions. He also supervised multiple cases in which the SEC prosecuted financial institutions and individuals for defrauding investors in the sale of complex derivative securities tied to subprime mortgages. President Barack Obama appointed Kuzami to serve as co-chair of two federal state task force created to prosecute financial crisis misconduct, and he testified on 11 occasions before House and Senate congressional committees. In the private sector, Kuzami was a partner at Kirkland and Ellis LLP, worked as general counsel at Deutsche Bank, and was an associate at Cadwallader. Kuzami is a 1979, is a 1983 graduate, magna cum laude, from the University of Rochester, where he received his BA in political science and philosophy and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. He also served as a law clerk to the Honorable John R. Gibson of the United States Court of Appeals for the for the Eighth Circuit from 1983 to 1984. Indeed, it is my honor to introduce Robert Kuzami. Okay, BU Law is in the house. That, that wasn't in the script, but it just felt like the right thing to say. So I'm honored uh, to share your day today uh, with you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, also, a very special greeting to those who are watching your law school commencement on C-SPAN. Hello, hello, and hello. I think that's just about everybody. Now, today, graduates, uh, you are what you set out to be, attorneys. And your reward for that? A lifetime of lawyer jokes. <laughs> Everyone will congratulate you for graduating, but not as many will appreciate your profession. It's as old as time, or at least as old as Shakespeare. In his famous play, Henry VI, Part II, Shakespeare wrote, the first thing we do, we kill all the lawyers. <laughs> for 500 years, critics have used the quote to express a collective hostility to our profession. And as I'm sure you recall from your casual reading of 16th century drama, Shakespeare's Jack Cade was a lawless demagogue, secretly planning to overthrow King Henry V and assume the throne. His second in command, Dick the Butcher, said the very first thing we'll do is kill the lawyers. And while it sounds like an early version of a lawyer joke, 
scholars tell us that Shakespeare was not in fact criticizing lawyers, but was paying tribute to them. You see, Dick the Butcher understood that chaos was critical to the success of their rebellion, and that the fastest way to chaos was to eliminate those who stood for the rule of law, lawyers. And Shakespeare was right. Lawyers are the guardians of the rule of law. To take just one example, at least 23 of 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were lawyers, and 21 of 39, more than half of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention were lawyers. And in guarding the rule of law, lawyers do something even more important. They guard something even more precious and more fundamental, and that is truth. Truth is a common understanding of facts and reality, an agreement among members of society as to the way the world is and the way it is organized. But today, truth is under great stress. More and more, truth rests not on facts, not on logic, not on intellectual examination, but on opinion, impulse, and intuition to further a partisan political agenda. Some say we are living in a post-truth world. Stephen Colbert says our public debate lacks truthiness. Others say we suffer from tooth decay. Like the modern-day philosopher George Costanda once remarked to a friend, Jerry, it's not a lie if you believe it. For those of you under 30, that's from Seinfeld. You know, that's the one with the woman from Veep. Here are some facts about what passes for truth today. Approximately 50% of the population believes that the government was behind the 9-11 attacks. Nearly half of Republicans and about 24% of Democrats believe in Pizzagate, the allegation that Hillary Clinton and others ran an underage prostitution network in the basement of a DC pizza restaurant. Other examples, that climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese to ruin the American economy or that vaccines cause autism. Fake Twitter accounts from the right and the left, not to mention from our adversaries overseas, add more facts to this list every day. So the question, graduates, is how will you protect truth in the finest tradition of our profession? How will you make sure that you're on Dick the Butcher's hit list? To paraphrase from Shakespeare once again, let me count the ways. First, you must practice law with honesty and integrity, because an honest person speaks the truth. Those ethical principles are reflected in the model code of professional responsibility. But more importantly, before you knew anything about the model code, you were taught honesty, you were taught integrity by your parents or other peoples of influence. I learned ethics when I was eight years old, when I went to the hardware store with my father. We bought a can of paint. My father gave him a $10 bill. The clerk gave back change for a 20. My father said, you gave me too much change and returned the $10 bill. Most of what I needed to know about ethics, I learned in those three minutes in a hardware store 50 years ago. And I'll bet most of you have a similar story. And if you don't have such a story, I'm here to tell you that you're in luck because there are many lawyers today who can teach you ethics. They just approach it a little differently than my father did. Their approach is to be living examples of what not to do ethically. <laughs> All you have to do is the opposite of what they do, and you know who I'm talking about. The media hounds who traffic in lies and half-truths and bombast, all ablaze in their roles as press flax or opportunistic grifters or cable news ideologues. Those are the kind of lawyers that Dick the Butcher would have hired, not eliminated. Now, truth can be a little more complicated when you represent a client, as many of you soon will, because you owe your clients a duty of loyalty and zealous advocacy. And that duty can make truth a little trickier, for your client may not always be interested in the truth or even a small piece of it. But remember, as lawyers, we are ethically bound to be honest and truthful. Clients are not. Keep that distinction in mind when a client is trying to put the squeeze on you to cross the line into deceit. 
And to be fair to clients, much deceit in our profession is self-generated by lawyers, driven by ego and the desire to win. It's easy to rationalize a lie when you think it's really just a modest one or not one at all or more gray than black and white. And remember, as Ned Stark would have told you if only he hadn't been decapitated in the first season of Game of Thrones, if you tell one lie, the second one gets a little easier. And for the realists among you, as opposed to the ethicists, lying and deceit in the practice of law is a fool's game. You lose your credibility and your reputation when you dispute facts with far-fetched versions of events, when you sweep bad facts under the rugs, when you make ad hominem attacks against your adversaries. If you tell the truth and then you fight vigorously for your client, despite the bad facts, despite the difficult events, you'll be a better lawyer and your client will be better served. And sometimes in private practice, truth and your client obligations are in harmony. Take our own Theodore Koskoff, a class of 1936 graduate of this great law school. He started the Koskoff firm in Connecticut. At eight decades later, the firm he found took on truth for a client when it sued Alex Jones, the far-right conspiracy theorists of InfoWars fame. Jones had for years been spreading the vile lie that the Sandy Hook massacre in Newtown, Connecticut, in which 20 first graders were murdered, was a hoax. That no deaths had occurred, that crisis actors were masquerading as grieving parents, and that the entire episode was a plot by a shadow government to promote the cause of gun control. The Koskoff firm represented the parents and sued Jones for defamation, and eventually, under oath, he was forced to admit that Sandy Hook was real and suggested that he be in suffering from psychosis when he said otherwise. So remember, there are places you can go in the practice of law in our profession where truth is your client. Find them and seek them out. And another place where you can find truth is in the public sector, where truth is your client as well. I worked two stints in the United States Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York and once at the SEC. And truth was at the heart of both jobs. As a prosecutor, of course, you want to win, but you win only if you do so consistently with truth, fairness, and justice. And if there's a conflict, then truth wins. I went to the SEC in the immediate wake of the financial crisis and the revelations of the Madoff scheme. The push to file cases against bank and financial institutions was high pressure and nonstop. The public demanded it, and understandably so, given the greed and the risk-taking that occurred during that time. And we filed many cases, but there are many others we did not, because truth would not allow it. We would have been applauded had we filed those cases. We may have even gotten a lot of settlements from banks and financial institutions who would have paid to settle, but it would have been wrong. Truth succeeded over winning. And graduates, the issue of truth is coming your way sooner than you think. In the next few months, some jurisdiction is going to announce you fit to practice law. And from that point on, you'll be as live an actor in the profession as Bill Barr or Eric Holder or David Boies or Ruth Bader Ginsburg or a young Thurgood Marshall who at 26 started representing the NAACP in civil rights cases. You will have taken the same oath as all of them and you will face your moment of truth. And many of those moments of truth occur, as Lin-Manuel Miranda tells us, in the room where it happens. My father emigrated from Lebanon at age two, never knew his father, and didn't get past the eighth grade. But a generation later, I've been fortunate enough to be in the room where it happens, where decisions of life and death, capital punishment, decisions of national significance, terrorism, financial crisis, and the corruption of public officials and persons are made. And I can tell you two things about the room where it happens. First, the chairs in the room are not reserved for those with the fancy legal credentials. I've seen Supreme Court clerks stumble and fail to measure up on their first days on the job. And those with less gold-plated credentials become legal superstars. Getting the credential is not the important thing. It's how you perform in the job once you are there. Let me give you an example of why the credential isn't always very impressive. 
When I was a third year law student at BU, I desperately wanted to clerk on the district court. But those fancy New York and Boston and DC clerkships were out of my reach. I didn't graduate cum laude. I graduated more like thank you laude. <laughs> so I applied to every district court and every decent sized city in the South and Midwest, anywhere I thought I could tolerate for a couple years, more than 100 applications. I got one callback out of more than 100 applications from Judge John Gibson in Kansas City, who was on the hunt for a clerk who had the one attribute that I clearly possessed, being from the East Coast. <laughs> you see, Judge Gibson really put a priority on geographic balance. And he had his clerk from the West Coast, and he had his clerk from the Midwest. Since I was from the East Coast, I got the job. And let's do the math. So there were 121,000 law students that year. If you divide by three to isolate the number of third years, that gets you to about 40,000. And I learned that the East Coast represents about 30% of the US population. So to determine how many East Coast third year law students there were, you take 30% of 40,000, you get 12,000. So I was one of 12,000 lawyers that year who could have had that clerkship had they applied. And then as the icing on the cake, turns out that Judge Gibson was nominated by the president to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in the middle of my application process. I didn't even know it. So I ended up with a clerkship on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals that I didn't even apply for. So good of me to have applied to Judge Gibson to be sure, but certainly nothing to be intimidated about when you think about the clerkship. The second thing about the room where it happens is that all of you are capable of handling the most difficult issues in that room. Those are the ethical issues, honesty, truth, integrity, and justice. And as to those questions, there's no advanced degree of honesty and truth. There's no clerkship on the Supreme Court of Integrity. No one's credentials in that room gives them a monopoly on ethics. No one's credentials in that room gives them a backbone needed to choose truth to say no when everyone else is saying yes. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you don't belong in the room where it happens. Finally, truth can be your client when you join the public debate, not as a lawyer, but simply as a concerned member of society, as a participant in our democracy. We desperately need your voices in government and in politics. And it's because the erosion of truth is real and serious. In Pizzagate, a man actually showed up at that pizza restaurant with an assault rifle to confront the supposed sex traffickers and to rescue the captive children he thought he would find there. The vaccine myth has revived measles, a sometimes fatal disease that was once almost eradicated. And climate change, if the lies prevail, the consequences will be catastrophic. Your voice is a valuable and informed one in that and all of our public debates because of your BU legal training. You've been taught that facts matter. You've been taught that serious engagement with your adversary matters. You've been taught that scientific and expert evidence matters. You've been taught that opinions are one thing and facts are another. All of us need to join the debate, not just graduates, but parents and friends and family and faculty, all of us. For God's sakes, Kim Kardashian is joining the debate. <laughs> I understand she wants to be a lawyer to fight for criminal justice reform. God bless her, welcome to the fight for truth. And it's not about the issue that you choose, that's your business. Environmentalism, school choice, women's rights, religious freedom, Voter fraud or voter registration, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that there's more and more truth in our public debates. What does matter is that we all recognize that truth may not match our preconception. What does matter is that we recognize that problematic facts, even when they don't serve our goals, and incorporate them into our thinking. What does matter is that we change our minds when truth demands it. Graduates, all of us, Bring your learning and your voice to the public square. It is needed now. Commencement means beginning. To mark this beginning, I ask you to commit here today to the principles of truth and justice. 
underline the American legal system and our democracy, to commit now to a career premised on honesty and integrity, independent thought, and fundamental rights, to commit now to truth before our beloved country sinks even deeper into partisanship and rancor, and to commit now not to settle for the safe and secure. As Rousseau once said, there is security in dungeons, but that does not make them enviable places to live. Stay out of the dungeon, get in the fight for truth, commit now to make this day, this beginning, this commencement, this moment, your moment of truth. Thank you.